The sensory information that our body is subject to is due to changes in the internal and the external environment. And so what we respond to are different stimuli. And the way that we consciously process information and are aware of it is called sensation. And so only a stimulus that reaches the cerebral cortex of the brain results in the sensation of that that is the stimulus. And so we actually only pay attention to a very small fraction of the stimuli that we're constantly exposed to and rather we ignore all the rest of it. And so the stimuli that we detect are due to different receptors. First, let's get into the senses. And so we have several different senses that we will focus on. The first is touch, and this is a tactile response. And so this is what we perceive within our skin. And so we respond to different vibrations and pressures um, within the external environment. Also, we have taste. And so here, our receptors respond to different chemicals. And so these are our, our taste dense. We also have smell, which again, our receptors respond to different chemicals, and so these are different odorants that we find within our nose. We have sight, which are found within our photoreceptors of our eye, and what they do is respond to different light waves. We have hearing, which is responsible for different vibrations of sound that then is transmitted into the brain. And then finally, we have equilibrium, which is also part of our vestibular system and found within our ear. And then so here we pay attention to balance. So within our sensory system, we have differences in uh, receptors which respond best to certain stimuli. And so the first type of receptor that we have are chemoreceptors. And so these detect changes within chemicals, so such as within our food, our drink, our body fluids, and inhaled air. And so we find chemoreceptors within our gustatory system as well as with our olfactory system. Thermal receptors respond to differences in temperature, whether it be hot and cold. And so a lot of this is found within our skin, but also internally as well within the body. Mechanoreceptors are responsible for detecting changes in touch, pressure, vibration, and stretch. And are predominantly found within the skin, but also we find some within the ear for equilibrium. We have photoreceptors that are found within our eye, and so these respond to differences in light intensity, so contrasting day and night, uh, color, as well as movement, so that we're able to track objects as they move along. Noci receptors, these respond to pain, and so these are found everywhere within the body and they respond to chemical uh, temperature as well as mechanical changes or mechanical stresses of pain. And then lastly, we have baroreceptors, which respond to differences in pressure within body structures and are found throughout the body. And so these are especially important within the cardiovascular system where these would help to um, signal within, say, low blood pressure would be a sign that baroreceptors would be triggered. There are two main types of tactile receptors that we find within our skin. And the first are unencapsulated tactile receptors. And so this means that they don't have connective tissue that wraps around them. And so they're very simple in structure. So the first one are free nerve endings. And so these are terminal branches of different dendrites. And they are the closest to the surface of the skin, which is usually within the papillary layer of the dermis. They detect pain and temperature changes, but sometimes also light touch and pressure as well. Next is the root hair plexus, and these are specialized for uh, hair follicles in the reticular layer of the dermis. So these quickly adapt, meaning that as soon as you put clothes on or a watch or a ring, then your body does not have to spend the entire time being aware of the clothing, the jewelry, or whatever else is on your body so that you're not consciously spending time and also energy on these different items. Tactile discs or Merkel discs and Merkel cells or tactile cells 
are nerve endings that are responsible for detecting fine touch. And so these help to distinguish differences in texture and shape of the different stimuli. The second type of tactile receptors are encapsulated receptors, and so these are covered by either connective tissue or by glial cells, and there are four different types. So the first are cross bulbs, and these are found near the border of the stratified squamous epithelium in the mucous membrane of the oral cavity, the nasal cavity, the vagina, and anal can canal, and these detect light pressure stimuli and low frequency vibrations. Tactile corpuscles, which are also known as Meisner's corpuscles, are going to be very large and they're encapsulated oval receptor in shape. And so these respond to light touch, shape, and texture, and we find these within the dermal papilla of the skin, within, especially within the lips, the palms, the eyelids, the nipples, and the genitals. The lamelliated or fascinian corpuscles are large receptors that detect deep pressure and high frequency vibrations. And so they only respond to deep pressure stimulus where and thus are found deep within the reticular layer of the dermis, in the subcutaneous layer of the palms of the hands, in the soles of the feet, the breast, and the external genitalia as well as in synovial membranes of joints and the walls of different organs. And lastly, we have the Ruffini corpuscles, which are responsive to continuous deep pressure and distortion in the skin. And so these actually do not adapt and are found within the dermis and the subcutaneous layer of the integument. Gustation is our sense of taste, and it uses chemoreceptors, however, they have to come in contact with a substance, such as the food or drink that we are exposed to, to experience its actual flavor. And so the gustatory or taste cells are taste receptors that are housed in specialized sensory organs called taste buds. And these are found on the tongue surface. On the dorsal surface of the tongue are epithelial and connective tissue elevations called papilla, where we have four different main types that respond to different types of foods. The four main types of papilla that we have are first valate or the circumvallate, and so these are going to be the least numerous, yet they are the largest papilla that we have on our tongue, and they're found in an inverted V shape on the dorsal posterior surface of our tongue. And so this is where we also find most of our taste buds that are found on the walls of, along the sides that are facing the depression. Next we have fungiform papilla, and these are black-like projections that are found mostly on the tip and sides of the tongue, but they only contain just a few taste buds each. Next, the filiform papilla are short and spiky, and they're found along the anterior two-thirds of the dorsal tongue surface. And these do not have any taste buds, thus they have no role in gustation. And then finally, we have the foliate papilla. And these are underdeveloped, actually, within our um, tongue. And usually, in, during infancy and early childhood, there are a few taste buds there. And this one um, hypothesis as to why children are so picky when they eat is because of these extra taste buds. But they're sensitive to different chemicals within the food. We have numerous taste receptors that are called gustatory cells or gustatory receptors that are enclosed by different supporting cells. And so the dendritic ending of each gustatory cell is formed by a slender gustatory microvillus or sometimes called just a taste hair. And so these extend through an opening in the taste bud which is called the taste pore on the surface of the tongue. And so this is the receiving portion of the cell that responds to the different chemicals that we find within our food. However, we have to have saliva in order for the food to be dissolved and so that we can actually respond to the differences in the chemicals. 
the gustatory cells are modified epithelial cells and are replaced every 10, seven to 10 days due to a population of stem cells called the basal cells. Beginning about age 50, we start to see differences and declines in taste due to uh, decreases in the cell replacement and the number of taste buds. And so this is a lot of times why like your grandparents or even some of your parents often over salt or over spice different foods is because it, they are literally losing taste buds and sensation within their um, gustatory pathway. Our tongue detects five basic sensations. So we have our salty, our sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. Salty is due to metal ions like potassium and sodium that's found in our food or drink. Sweet is due to differences in organic compounds like sugars. Our sour taste is due to different hydrogen ions from acids. And then bitter taste is from alkaloids, toxins, and poisons. And then umami is due to amino acids such as glutamate or aspartate. And so our taste receptors then are more sensitive to different taste sensations of bitter and sour because these might be indications of something toxic or poisonous. And so that's why we can't really tolerate those as well. Well, once we have these different taste sensations enter our taste buds, then we have this information that travels through cranial nerve number seven, or the facial nerve, from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, and cranial nerve number nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve, from the posterior one-third of the tongue. And so first this goes through the medulla oblongata, then it goes, this, uh, the gustatory information goes into the thalamus, for processing, and then finally it will synapse on the primary gustatory cortex just found within the insula where we can analyze all the different components of food, including the temperature, the texture, and the smell. Olfaction is our sense of smell, and within our, this is found within our nasal cavity where we have paired olfactory organs that are responsible for smell. We have First, an olfactory epithelium that lines the superior part of the nasal septum. And it has three different cell types. The first are olfactory receptor cells, or olfactory neurons, and these are what actually detect or odors. We also have supporting cells that sandwich the olfactory neurons and maintain the receptors. And then finally, basal cells, which function as stem cells because just like our gustatory receptor cells. These are modified every few days. Olfactory receptor cells are replaced every 30 to 60 days. And they are bipolar neurons that are very unique in the sense that previously thought neurons within the brain could never regenerate. Well, these are a major exception that has totally changed the playing field of neuroscience and neurobiology. And so these are also the odorant receptors that are responsible for detecting different chemicals within the air. And the knobby-like projections also have these olfactory hairs, which house the receptors that respond to differences of chemicals within the air environment that we breathe. With our olfactory system, we can recognize about eight primary odors among all human. And however, all of us can respond to many different thousands of different chemical stimuli. However, they're not all going to be the same among all individuals. And so some of the common odors that people respond to are a camphorous or a very strong smell, a fishy, a malty, minty, musky, and sweaty scent. And so after that, then we can detect odors that are going to be unique for everyone. So for instance, if you smell something like a flower, there could be over a, or a hundred different smells or chemicals that you're responding to, yet they'll be different for every individual. And so once we are exposed to different odors and chemicals, then the olfactory nerve, cranial nerve number one, has its axons that are going to be bundled into the olfactory neuron axons that project 
through the foramina or the holes of the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone and then enters a pair of olfactory bulbs that are inferior to the frontal lobes of the brain. The neurons within the olfactory bulbs then will project axon bundles called olfactory tracts to the primary olfactory cortex in the temporal lobe of the cerebrum. The next sensation is vision. And with vision, this is where we devote most of our brain towards, which about 30% of our brain is devoted, devoted towards vision, and it is the most highly developed within us humans. The visual receptor cells, or the photoreceptors, are going to be responsible for detecting light and color. And so these are found within the retina, which is the, on the neural tunic on the back side of our eye. And we have two main types of photoreceptors. We have rods and cones. And rods and cones vary depending on their shape, where rods look more like a rod shape at the tip of the neuron, and then cones have more of a conical shape at their tip. And so rods are responsible for uh, being able to process night vision, and so we respond to differences in contrast of dark, However, we cannot see color with our rods. Cones, on the other hand, are responsible for high-intensity light, so what we use in the daytime, as well as with our color vision. And with our cones, we only have three types of cones. We have blue, red, and green, and so any combination of other colors, say turquoise, yellow, brown, there are just going to be different activations of the number of red, blue, and green cones that are activated due to different wavelengths that we see um, bouncing off. So our photoreceptors, however, do not regenerate within our retina, and so it is true that once you burn out your uh, photoreceptors, they will not come back. And so over time, this naturally happens, a lot of it due to UV light that we're exposed to throughout our lifetime. To begin with the accessory structures of the eye, we first have the conjunctiva. And so this is a specialized stratified squamous epithelium that forms a continuous lining of the external anterior surface of the eye, as well as the internal surface of the eyelid. And there are many different structures uh, and cells that are found within the conjunctiva and they're predominantly responsible for lubrication and moistening of the eye. And they're also helps to supply a lot of blood vessels for our eyes and the avascular sclera or the whites of our eyes. And we have free nerve endings that detect foreign objects as they come in contact with our eye. And so when, say, your contact falls out of place, it's irritated, and so the conjunctiva is responsible for that with the free nerve endings. Um, one thing to note is that there is no conjunctiva on the surface of the cornea because that is what regulates light that comes into our retina so that um, our photoreceptors can react. And so for some of you, this is where a lot of times infection occurs as well, and so if you've ever had pink eye, then you've had conjunctivitis, and so this is just a bacterial infection that affects the conjunctiva of our eyes. The next accessory structure of the eye is the lacrimal apparatus, and this is what produces, collects, and drains lacrimal fluid, or tears, from our eyes. So the fluid lubricates the anterior surface of our eye, and this helps to reduce friction from our eyelid movement, and it also continuously cleanses and moistens the eye surface and helps to prevent bacterial infections because they have special enzymes called lysozymes that are responsible for the antimicrobial-like properties. The lacrimal gland is found within the superior lateral depression of each orbit, and so this is where tears are continuously produced. Every time we blink, this helps to wash away the lacrimal fluid that's released from our excretory ducts over our eyes. With then following blinking, what happens is that the fluid travels to the lacrimal canaliculi, and so these will be um, drainage points 
that empty into tubes that will dump into the lacrimal sac. Lacrimal sacs are responsible for collecting excess tears. And then finally, the nasal lacrimal duct receives that lacrimal fluid and delivers the fluid to the nasal cavity where then it mixes with mucus. Our eye is divided into three main tunics or layers that we find. The first one is the fibrous tunic, and so this is going to be the sclera in the cornea and co are composed of the most external layer of the eye. The vascular tunic or layer will be the middle layer, and this is where we find our iris, ciliary body, and choroid. And as you can expect, fibrous meaning that will, or I'm sorry, vascular meaning that it will have vascularization, so a lot of capillary beds found within it. And then the deepest layer is the neural tunic, which is the retina, and this is where we house our photoreceptors of our cones and rods, and is ultimately responsible for our vision and what we see and adapt to. The fibrous tunic, or layer, is the external layer of the eye wall, and so the first structure, the sclera, is considered to be the white part of the eye, and it is formed as by a, the tough, dense, irregular connective tissue, and so composed of both collagen and elastic fibers. This is what actually gives our eyes shape, and it protects our eyes' um, delicate internal structures of especially the photoreceptors. Next we have the cornea, and this is the transparent avascular part of the fibrous tunic. And it has a convex shape and is responsible for bending light rays that enter into our light or into our eye. And so this also has a layer of uh, epithelium that helps to join with the sclera at the layer of the epithelium. Uh, the cornea has no blood vessels, and so it must obtain nutrients and exchange gases by either the anterior chamber of the eye as well as by the lacrimal glands. Within the vascular layer, or the middle layer of the eye, we find the choroid, which is the most extensive and posterior region of the vascular tunic. This is where we have a huge amount of capillaries that supply nutrients and oxygen for the retina, which is the innermost layer of the cell, or of the eye, as well as for the middle layer. We have the ciliary body, which is found on anterior to the choroid, and here we find ciliary muscles that are responsible for relaxation and contraction for altering the shape of the lens. And so this is for accommodation. Um, when we have problems, this is where a lot of times individuals will have to have glasses because uh, the muscles are unable to bend the lens anymore. Lastly, we have the iris. And this is the found in the most interior region of the vascular tunic and it is the colored portion of the eye. In the middle of the iris, we also have a black hole called the pupil, and the iris controls how the size of the pupil, which ultimately restricts or, adapt or changes the amount of light that enters the eye. There are two main muscles that regulate the pupil and how much light that enters. The first, the sphincter pupillae, which is also known as a pupillary constrictor, is arranged in a pattern that resembles concentric circles around the pupil. And so this is under the control of the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, and so it constricts the pupil, thus decreasing the amount of light that will enter. And so this is important for when, uh, in times when we don't need to be aware of our situation. And so when we're relaxed, we have uh, constriction of our pupil. The second muscle, which is the dilator pupillae, or pupillary dilator, 
is responsible for dilating the pupil, so increasing the amount of light that enters. And so this is controlled by our sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. And so during times of fight or flight, when we're in emergency situations, our pupils will increase the amount of light that enters so that we are more aware of our um, surroundings so that we can respond quickly to some whatever stimulus that we might be in, in interaction with. The internal layer of the eye is the neural tunic, and this is the retina. And so the retina houses all the photoreceptors, which again are the rods and cones. And so in this image, the rods are going to be the orange colored neurons, and the cones are these purple colored neurons. And again, the rods are, have a rod-shaped outer part, and their function is for dim light, whereas cones have a cone-shaped outer part, and their function is for high-intensity light and color vision. Within the neural tunic, we have an area of the eye called the macula lutea. And so this is found on the posterior pole of the eye, and it has this yellowish color torqued to it. Within the macula lutea, we have the fovea centralis. And so within the fovea centralis, this is going to be a pit that has the highest concentration of cones. And so this is where we have the sharpest vision. And so why we can focus on very fine details of what we see. So like when you're reading a book or, you know, reading a PowerPoint or on your phone texting, that is due to your fovea centralis. Now we have a blind spot within our eye, and this is the optic disc. And this is such that the optic disc actually is a hole within the retina where the axons and blood vessels exit out from the eye and enter into the optic nerve. And so the optic nerve helps to make up that layer of the retina. However, it has to do so at the entry point of the optic disc. So your optic disc is your blind spot and your fovea centralis is going to be your best spot for vision. The lens is a transparent structure that is dense, fibrous, and is elastic. And it is directly behind the cornea and the iris and the pupil. And the lens focuses incoming light on the retina, and then its shape determines the degree of refraction. And part of the lens adjusting shape is due to the suspensory ligaments that attach the lens capsule to the periphery and so that different tensions can change the shape of the lens. So for instance, when we have a flat lens, this is necessary for far vision, and this is what our default position is. But then when we have to see objects close up, the t lens tends to become more spherical in shape, and thus can refract the light rays and focus the image on the retina, and this is termed accommodation, and so we use this um, throughout every day. The shape of the lens allows us to either see up close or far away. Our lens is in a flattened position and this is our default position for when we are looking at things far away. The ciliary muscles of the eye tend to relax and then there is an increase in tension among the suspensory ligaments and this allows us to view objects at a faraway distance. When we are looking at objects up close, we undergo something called accommodation. And what happens is that the lens becomes more spherical to bend the light rays and focus the image on the retina itself. And here we have the suspensory ligaments. Now the tension decreases. However, the ciliary muscles contract to allow for this change or and pull on the lens to see objects up close. 
the internal space of the eye is subdivided by the lens into two separate cavities, an anterior cavity and a posterior cavity. The anterior cavity is the space anterior to the lens and posterior to the cornea. The iris of the eye subdivides the anterior cavity into two chambers, a anterior chamber and a posterior chamber. The anterior chamber is the area that is between the iris and the cornea, and here we find the aqueous humor, which is a filtrate of plasma and is produced by epithelium covering the ciliary body. This helps to remove waste products and maintain the chemical environment within the anterior and posterior chambers of the eye. The posterior chamber is between the lens and the iris, and the posterior cavity is posterior to the lens, and it is surrounded laterally, superiorly, inferiorly, and posteriorly by the retina. Here we find the vitreous hum humor, and this completely fills the space between the lens and the retina. The vitreous humor helps maintain the shape of the eye, helps to support the retina, and also to help transmit light from the lens onto the retina. To sum it all up, the visual pathway begins when light enters the eye and is detected by photoreceptors in the retina. This light causes a change in the rods and cones on the retina, and these photoreceptors then signal the change to the bipolar cells. They signal to the ganglion cells and then generate a nerve impulse. The information is collected and integrated in the retina, where then that information travels to the ganglionic axons that converge to form the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve number two, and the optic nerves then project from each eye through the optic chasm, which is immediately anterior to the pituitary gland. Here we have information from both sides of the eye, and there's some crossing over of the fibers. Next, we go into the optic tracts that are formed laterally from the optic chasm as a composite of ganglionic axons that originate at the retinas of each eye. The ear is partitioned into three distinct The ear is responsible for our hearing and our equilibrium. It is partitioned into three distinct regions. The outer ear, which is the most external part of the ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. Our external ear is mostly a cartilaginous structure that is covered by skin and it is sometimes called the auricle or the pinna. It is funnel-shaped, and it protects the entry into the ear and to direct sound waves to the bony tube called the external acoustic meatus. This extends medially and slightly superiorly from the lateral surface of the head. The external acoustic meatus ends at the tympanic membrane, or our eardrum, which is a delicate funnel-shaped epithelial sheet that is part the partition between the external and the middle ear. The tympanic membrane vibrates when sound waves hit it, and then these vibrations provide the means for transmission of sound into the middle and the inner ear. The middle ear contains an air-filled tympanic cavity and medially a bony wall that houses the oval window and round window separates the middle ear from the inner ear. 
The tympanic cavity maintains an open connection with the atmosphere through the auditory tube, which is also the Alsatian tube, and this also opens into the nasopharynx, the upper throat, from the middle ear. It's usually closed in a slit-like opening as its connection to the nasopharynx. We also find the smallest bones within the body are auditory ossicles, which is the malleus, the incus, and the stapes from external to internal. From lateral to medial, we have the malleus, which resembles a hammer, and it is attached to the medial surface of the tympanic membrane. And it is suspended by ligaments bound to the wall of the tympanic cavity to hold it in place. The incus resembles an anvil and it is the middle auditory ossicle and the stapes which resembles a stirrup on a saddle has a cylindrical disc-like foot plate that fits on the oval window which is an opening that marks the lateral wall of the inner ear. These three auditory ossicles help to amplify sound waves and transmit them to the inner ear. This is done through the oval window. When sound waves strike the tympanic membrane, the three ossicles vibrate along the membrane and causing the foot plate of the stapes to move in and out of the oval window. This creates pressure waves in the fluid which is found within the inner ear. In this picture we have the inner ear, mostly the auditory ossicles, and also the auditory tube which allow has air movement through the tube as a result of chewing, yawning, and swallowing, and its purpose is to equalize the pressure within the middle ear to the external environment. The inner ear is a series of bony labyrinth or bony maze-like passageways that are membrane-lined in fluid-filled tubes and spaces. Here we find the receptors for equilibrium and for hearing that are found within the supporting cells of the epithelium that line the labyrinth. The space between the outer walls of the bony labyrinth and the membrane is filled with perilymph, and this is similar to that of the cerebral spinal fluid because it's both an extracellular fluid and it is clear in color. The perilymph helps to suspend, to support, and to protect the membrane labyrinth from the walls of the bony labyrinth. We also have the endolymph, and this is found within the membrane part of the labyrinth. And this is unique because it exhibits a low sodium and high potassium concentration that is similar to our intracellular fluid. The semicircular canals help to make up the labyrinth of the inner ear. And there are three of them, and all three contain endolymph. And within the semicircular canals, there are motion sensors within the endolymph. The purpose of these are to detect sensory input for different rotations of movement. The cochlea is one of the main structures responsible for hearing. The cochlea is a snail-shaped spiral chamber in the bone of the inner ear. Attached to the cochlea are the hair cells, which will vibrate and activate once certain frequencies excite them. The sound waves from the cochlea produce nerve impulses that generate hearing. So now let's put it all together and how we actually hear. First, Sound waves are funneled through the external ear by the auricle. The sound waves travel down the external auditory canal where the sound then vibrates the tympanic membrane. The, tympan the vibration of the tympanic membrane causes movement of the auditory ossicles, which are in the middle ear. The stapes moves into the perilymph of the inner ear, different frequencies then will result in pressure wave formation within the endolymph 
of the cochlea. And then finally, the corresponding hair cells will then bounce and cause a stimulus that is sent to the cochlear branch of the eighth cranial nerve. The information that is picked up from the cochlear branch and the vestibular branch merge to form cranial nerve number eight, the vestibular cochlear nerve, where information then travels through the axons and neurons and synapse onto the inferior colliculi with the, within the mesencephalon. These neurons extend axons to the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus and then finally terminate on the primary auditory cortex of the temporal lobe where these nerve impulses are able to, perceive, to be perceived as sounds.